Because if I gave it, and like I, and I like large a little bit, you know, it's five different ones, one that's pretty small. Then all these run up to the mud. Well, yeah, except I think this room has that, that more HTTP. That is the whole problem with this endeavor. It's right. Always going to be like, nice. Yeah, but I think <laughs> there's way more things that we can use that. So the, the DNS people will be there, There's no X's or OK? Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I think I think the DNS okay. people will have different preferences. I think the will actually have technical questions. Yeah. So, but but let's both stand. We can even stand next to each other in the box. Uh, <laughs> Better that than me behind you. Yeah, actually, you want to go over that? I'll be right? making little ears and everything. Uh, <laughs> Great. Well, let's go to the agenda. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, I mean, I don't think the door is Yeah. 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 So let's put it this way. I believe that it's for the same. Well, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's like when And just to be clear. So the other question is, how does the, yeah, do well, right, which I just did try to do. Yeah. Um, I I I I I I I I I Wait, you're saying you're doing it the way that we have. It's interesting that yeah, you have a different Maybe the room full screen. Screen. Don't I mean, okay. just saying, oh, we're doing it over. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that it matters that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for example, you know, there's one in DNS which is different than others. They can do whatever they want. In fact, that's probably the one you're doing, is the one for data. Right? That's different than ours. ours. Ours has very specific semantics. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Sure. Welcome, everybody. Okay, hey y'all, we're calling the meeting to order now. Okay, thank you everybody for coming to the uh, very first ever DNS over HTTPS working group session. Uh, don't, uh, note ye well. Uh, everything you say is important here. <laughs> I, I beg to defer. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing I'd also like to uh, point out is uh, we're very new as working group chairs, despite being at the ITF for a while. So please go gently on us to the ex uh, extent that we're fumbling our way through this. <laughs> Uh, and we we thank Tim and Ted for taking minutes and scribing. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick agenda back. Uh, well, actually, Ben's going to do the slides, and should we? 
<laughs> here, here, here's the stumbling through it part. Let's just go ahead with that. Uh, share slides. Okay, this is a brief description of the present moment. If this looks unfamiliar to you, you are in the wrong room. Yes. If this looks unfamiliar to you, you are in the wrong room. We are here to talk about this. Here's the plan. We're going to briefly tell you the thing that I'm telling you now. And then we're going to hand it over to Patrick and maybe Paul Hoffman, uh, who are the co-authors of the one draft that we have on our agenda today. We're going to hear what they have to say about the open issues on that draft. We have time to discuss anything you want to discuss about that draft. And then we have scheduled block for open discussion on all issues related to the entire concept of what we are doing here. So I would ask that if your questions are not directly protocol related, that you please hold them for the second half of the session. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have to agenda bash. This is, uh, this is Elliot. Um, I, th I think there's an open question still as to what lands in what document. And I'd just like to note that and say, as we go through the issues, in, I'm happy to defer anything that I have for the second half of the discussion. However, where things actually land at the end of the day, I'd like that to happen as we identify solutions. Because I don't think what I've been raising on the list requires a tremendous amount of text, and it would be really silly to create you know, a three to six paragraph internet draft to, you know, to address something. And I, I think the, at least one of the co-authors, I haven't talked to the other about it, but at least one of the co-authors understands the, you know, what I'm talking about. So, all right. Okay, noted. If you think that what you're discussing is, is directly relevant to changes in this draft, then by all means. Uh, but if possible, hold conceptual discussions for the second half of the session. So that's not what I understood Elliot asking for. He he asked that we we uh, have a discussion about the protocol and then a discussion about other topics without biasing ourselves to how that will manifest itself in documents, which I think is fine. OK. Um, we can amend the last 10 minutes. Instead of identify next drafts needed, we can say identify if any next drafts are needed or whether we can do everything in this draft. So that's all for the chair slides. And I believe we are now over to the draft slides. Yeah. <laughs> right. just, just, right. just to be clear, I had said we could both stand in the pink box. That's not happening. Your co like, hey, we do. Not that much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Regain my footing here. Um, yeah. Good afternoon. I guess we got 15 minutes, and I aspire to uh, stay within that time frame. Okay. Um, I think we all know why we're here. So um, three IETFs ago, we had a little barb off. Um, I arranged a room for 24 people. About 85 showed up. Um, and we talked about what DNS over HTTP means to you. And it turns out it meant something different to uh, everybody. So um, that has informed this work um, going forward. Um, last time around, we had a uh, dispatch version of this uh, proposal in Prague. And we ended up with this esteemed working group. Welcome and thank you. <coughs> Got to point it at the laptop. All right. Uh, we have a draft. Um, I love first wor working group meetings. How many people have read the draft? Uh, yeah, that's got to be around 50%, maybe more. That's awesome. Um, an 01 came out um, to, 
to capture some early feedback. Um, and I think the most important thing to note is we have essentially six months, according to our charter, to submit the specification to the IESG as a proposed standard. So um, I certainly don't want to spend my whole career on this document. So um, I appreciate everyone's help in making that happen. There's a GitHub set up. Um, ben and Dale, um, Dave, sorry, um, announced this on the mailing list. Um, there's a little screenshot of this from a few days ago. Um, as always, substantive discussion should remain on the mailing list. But you know, chatter always bleeds back and forth. So I would just have a personal recommendation to everyone out there to go just subscribe to the issues notification on the GitHub. It will make your life um, a whole lot easier. Okay, so because we've all uh, read the draft and we've all read the mailing list, we won't go through in detail um, everything that's gone on, but more or less we have uh, three, three distinct categories of issues that have been opened about the protocol draft. Now, if you have a new issue you'd like to make, you can either go open it in the GitHub yourself or you can you know, uh, make a comment on the mailing list and the editors will go um, do that for you if they realize you're raising a new issue instead of just contributing to an existing discussion. If you really want that issue open, you should either make that clear in your comment um, or open it yourself so that it doesn't just get incorporated into the discussion about, um, about something else. So there are um, three broad categories of things. Um, they are um, interaction with HTTP2, um, interaction with HTTP caching in general, and um, things I have labeled possibly editorial, um, hopefully editorial in my mind. So I, I think we've identified uh, two issues that are worth face-to-face -face time. So um, if I don't capture in my two issues for my 15 minutes up here um, what you want to talk about, I think uh, that's fine because of the way we've structured the agenda here. There's another 35 minutes. So um, please, I think um, this is a wonderful use to make uh, a wonderful use of our face-to-face -to -face time together. Okay. So one of the buckets that we've heard a lot about, um, yeah. So the current draft um, requires HTTP2 or its successors is actually what it says. So RFC 7540 or its successors. And I've tried to lay out sort of the pros and cons for this argument. On the pro side is essentially that for to achieve the necessary performance with DNS data being small and highly out of order, you need the multiplexing and priority mechanisms that HTTP2 provides you, specifically the multiplexing um, mechanisms, right? So you know when Deprive went about similar work, um, they built in a uh, um, an out of order response mechanism, which is going to be very, very similar to what HTTP2 is going to give you um, in this situation. And the, the argument to be made here is that um, the end result would simply not satisfy the use case if you didn't have that property. Okay. Uh, multiplexing becomes a bigger problem as responses get large. So if you want to do things like transfers and things like that, or this mechanism, um, the ability to do prioritization as well as multiplexing um, becomes key, um, something just a, a mere head of line blocking solution doesn't have. Um, and then uh, number four, the number four bullet down there is also really important, um, is that the um, HTTP overhead mitigation, the header overhead mitigation that goes along with HPAC and the other compression schemes may be necessary. As you look at the protocol, you'll find out that perhaps a preponderance of the bytes are actually um, in HTTP2 or are in HTTP headers, rather control data instead of DNS data, um, but HTTP2 will successfully mitigate a lot of that for you. Um, the last argument is over there, um, actually bullet number three, I apparently wrote them in a different order than I had them in my head, um, and that is just the notion that um, it is okay under some circumstances when doing new features to require best practices for those new features um, as a carrot, and I can think of a number of considerations um, where this may have made sense um, in the past. They may have helped move some technology forward. Um, I already see Martin and uh, Mark in queue. Can I go through the cons before we do that? Okay. Let's run all the way back here. No, all right, all right. So on the on the con side, you know, um, I think perhaps the winning argument at the end of the day is that the scheme is largely impractical. 
um, that it is hard for, say, a JavaScript implementation of this or a remotely deployed implementation of this to be aware of the infrastructure between it and the endpoint. So you may not even know what the client is running, even if you can control the uh, DNS API server, uh, much less know what downgrades may be enforced um, in the middle. Um, on a more positive note, you know, argument number two on the con is, you know, the whole point of, you know, using HTTP is to rely on the semantics of it to get a, a widely compatible and deployable benefit. This is, you know, this is why we develop things in layers and you should just put your trust um, in the layers. So rely on those semantics to get the full benefit of HTTP. Um, and the third argument is to say is sort of a counter argument to the it's okay to require best practices to say that requiring those best practices is an, actually an anchor around your neck and you'll never get Doe deployed. Um, at the bottom, I've listed the three obvious options, though I'm happy to hear others, which is to continue with the requirement, um, to have silence on the issue, which is to say we use HTTPS and not say what that means in terms of versioning, um, or to endorse HTTP2 with an explanation of why it is a good thing without any normative requirement. So that's my thoughts on the matter. So yeah, let's let's do this now and we'll go to the next one. I, I think as long as you guys are watching time, let's do this one and then we'll go to the next one. You can tell us when you're supposed to go. Yeah. So Martin Thompson, Paul just said, we'll do this one and then we'll do the next one when we resolve this, is that? Not when we resolve it, when we've sort of Oh, well, you need to use the microphone. Yeah, I can't hear you. So yes, let's do this one, and then they will tell us when we have to go to the next one. But let's do this while it's fresh in our heads. Right. Yep. Um, let's talk about the slide. Thanks. Thanks for summarizing all of the the options here. I think you've pretty much covered covered all the ground <laughs> reasonably well. Um, some of these are less important than than other ones. Um, I I think I originally argued for silence, but I like the endorsement actually. I, I think there's plenty of reasons to to recommend this, and obviously the performance is going to be uh, less good, I will say, on HTTP 1.1. Um, but um, that and security benefits and all the other things that HTTP 2 brings uh, are obviously improvements. But um, I would be opposed to a requirement for the reasons cited. Um, actually, before you go away, Martin. So if we go to endorsement with explanation. Um, how would you deal with the uh, out of order question, with, with the responses being out of order? Would we just say, you're only going to get what you get with HTTP 1, meaning you can't assume responses out of order? Uh, the, you get HTTP, is what we, you would say. Um, that is just a natural consequence of if you, if you choose to do HTTP 1.1, then naturally you are forced to basically make one request on a, on a connection at a time. You can't even really rely on pipelining working. Right. So, I mean, the other the other approach is how we always do multiplexing with HTTP one, which is uh, parallel TCP connections, right? Up to some yeah. kind of, up to some kind of limit. And I mean, I would note, you know, the directions each time we've had a revised HTTP, whether it was for you know one one or two, have been with direct, you know, charter level language saying, you know, thou must use fewer connections, right? That that's always been a goal of making it happen. And so to, you know, kind of invent a new higher level protocol that's going to have that implication is what makes me a little, you know, nervous. So we, so we always... Want, what I'm asking is, would you want words to like that effect if we do the endorse with explanation? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think okay. you, you, okay. you would articulate the advantages of HTTP2 and leave it there. Nothing more. I would be happy with a should, even, to, to that extent, and use these to justify the should, um, opposed to a must. Mark Nottingham. Um, I think it's fine to say, if you do this over HTTP 1, you might have a bad time, and to list out the various ways that that could happen. Um, but you know, you say, man in the middle up there, I mean, a lot of reverse proxies and a lot of CDNs talk H2 on the front end and H1 on the back end. And so I really don't think it's realistic to say that, you know, it has to be H2. You can't guarantee that. Um, what, what was, I, I, I missed something, I'm sorry. What was the discussion about ordering?
I'm a little confused why my ADP co-chair is asking that question, so I think we're talking about something different. <laughs> well, it, it, is someone assuming that there is an implicit ordering in, in HTTP2 of, of requests? No, there is an explicit ordering in HTTP1 of requests and responses. Uh, and that's not a good no. property for DNS over HTTP, which may want out of order okay. responses. Uh, so that's parallelism is a problem in H1. I think we can agree on that. that just, yeah, that, that's the point we're making. Uh, just please tell me that you're not assuming that if if in, you're you're getting the process of the, the the property of ordering of requests out of any version of HTTP. No, we're absolutely not. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Ian Sweat, Google. Uh, would there be any advantage? that the spec would have to restricting it to HTTP2 besides the obvious pros that you've laid out there? I mean, is there like, would it somehow make the spec fundamentally like easier to write or easier for, I mean, I mean. In practice, I think it's harder to deploy if you look under the con list, right? Okay. I mean, I think that's, it's, it is a little challenging to deploy if you have to limit it to HTTP2 only. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to comment is it's, at least for our load balancers, um, it would be quite difficult. It would be a very odd policy for us to restrict this to HTTP2 only. And it would be sufficiently odd that I don't think we would do it because it probably would violate some rule that, you know, if thou speaks, speaks HTTPS, it, it better work either way or something. And same with the, the load balancer backend comment is. Yeah, uh, I mean, so, yeah kind I, of a co combination of points one and two on the con side, right? It's a little impractical. And all those layers, there are they're semantic layers already, and they, they're not yeah. expecting that kind of. Okay. So, kind of I, yeah, so I, I would definitely say this is, a, this is a should. I mean, it really is should. You will probably get a really crappy experience if you don't use HTTP2. So if we, re if we recast endorse with explanation as uh, should, is this getting, with explanation. Is this getting support? Yeah, that, that is strong support for me. I mean, I think we should explain that like we really should use HTTP2, but I think forcing it is like totally impractical and probably a bad idea. Is that already, uh, totally impractical? Um, uh, I actually wanted to, uh, got up in order to, to suggest that we might want to say different things about clients and servers um, because there are going to be some servers in the future that have client bases oh. that are H2 only um, because of the deployment practice that uh, it's going to be common to them. And that uh, if you put it as should, you could end up in situations where the mix of what's available to uh, what's available on specific servers is unknown to clients. Um, and I think that's a bad situation. So what I was going to suggest is say that servers must support H2 and may support versions other than uh, versions below H2. Uh, and clients should support H2 um, with the uh, endorsements that you have there. And I think that will get you the the, the best mix of deployment. I, I do believe that there um, are, are cases, and I certainly understand the cases where you have uh, a front end and back ends that are different. And I actually don't think that those are really captured unless you break out the client and server requirements separately. Thank you. Just noting that we're closing the line after uh, Mark so that we can move on to the next. Uh, hi, this is Andrew Sullivan. I, I wonder if maybe part of the reason that we're um, foundering on this a little bit is because many of the people who are pushing back against this have forgotten that this is a transport for DNS. Um, and, and this isn't totally clear in the document, but I, I read this, this requirement as basically saying, well, you want to do this because it matches the operational reality of the, of, of DNS traditionally. So it could be that, that that is the way out of this, that if you do the should or something like that, in, in order to make it clear that the reason why this is the case is because DNS operates this way today, it's got lots of stuff in flight. And, and I think that that could be, you, you know, this is going to really suck if you try to do it over 1.1. Over yeah. Thanks. Whoops. John Levine. I mean, to, to me, the, this feels a certain lot like Re refighting, re refighting the use case arguments by proxy. You know, if you want to make everything, if you want to keep evil people from spying on you, you need HTTP two. If in my case, I just want to look up some SRV. Sorry. For for some use cases, you need HTTP two. Like if you want to keep evil people from spying on you, HTTP two is much more helpful. If you're in my case, I just want to look up some SRV records, so I don't really care what the transport is. So I think you know, endorse with explanation is plenty. <clears throat> Mark Nottingham, uh, I don't think a should is appropriate here 
when people read standards for better or worse, they see should, and then they use that as a bludgeon to beat people over the head with. Um, you know, the, the pros that you're listing here about multiplexing and about header size assume a certain deployment scenario. The reason that a lot of reverse proxies haven't done H2 on the origin side is that they, they don't feel they need it. They're using other techniques to get multiplexing and to mitigate these effects you're seeing that aren't used commonly by browsers. And and so I think if you want broad deployment, then 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 you you need to not cut things off arbitrarily. Uh, um, also, you know uh, the HTTP working group you you might be aware has just adopted a document uh, that talks about how to use HTTP as a substrate protocol, revising BCP fifty six bis. And when Andrew says things like HTTP as a transport, I bristle. And I get concerned about building that double hourglass. And I think Roy Fielding just woke up and screamed into the night. Um, so you'll, you'll get that feedback too if you go that way. So I will take this away as we will come up, we will come up with some wording. Um, I'm not sure if we'll say should or not. You know, we'll, we'll do that. But th this is still open, uh, but towards uh, endorse with explanation. And maybe that is a good time to slip in the PSA for BCP 56 bis, because I think um, the group should actually know it's not coincidental that the HTTP working group has taken that on at the same time as DOE was formed. Um, and it is one of my personal objection, objectives, not objections, objectives, um, to have DOE be sort of a, a good poster child for, um, for, for, uh, for that work of uh, best use of HTTP as a substrate. Um, that being said, we have just adopted that document and it is not a final thing, so we have a chance to sort of, you know, come up with that um, final, final resolution informed uh, from each other, yeah. Okay, so the other thing um, I wanted to make sure we talked about, though I'm sure we'll talk about a lot more, uh, is this bucket of issues um, regarding interaction with HTTP caching, um, which is not extensively um, defined in the document. And this not this is kind of thematic with the last set of questions of whether or not it, it really needs to be. Um, does HTTP already define everything we need to know? Um, so you can see um, these go from the concrete to more abstract. Um, uh, issue 13 is the most concrete, and I've um, actually already put a tentative resolution into what will be the next um, iteration of this draft. Um, and for that, it's talking about the um, HTTP freshness lifetime should be the shortest TTL of the response set. Um, so obviously, you can have you know multiple resource records come back with various different TTLs, but they're all coming back in one HTTP response. Um, so the resolution on this. Um, is rather than just saying it should be the shortest of those, that it must not be more than the shortest of those. So um, saying it can't be greater than the min. Um, the other issues here are, um, and that's already um, committed, but as we talked about before, you know, anything that gets committed off of GitHub is nothing other than an iteration of an internet draft, does not necessarily reflect consensus until we get consensus that will be declared by the chairs or through last call, all right? But that is just, you know, in the survive in advance, just trying to move forward model. The other issues are a little more abstract. They're saying, you know, the document doesn't specify a particular caching model. How does the DNS cache interact with the HTTP cache? How does that interact with the recursive resolver? Um, I think that's kind of implicit in there, but we can talk about that some. Um, and finally, the draft does discourage HTTP revalidation, um, given that it's fairly impractical for a bunch of these use cases. Although I've had a conversation with Martin um, that makes me think, um, we shouldn't be quite so firm on that topic. So um, that's my setup. Welcome, Mark Nottingham. Mark, Not <clears throat> Mark Nottingham. Uh, so issue 13, I think that's fine. I think I want to get in there and wordsmith exactly how you specify it. So um, you know, if you do it in terms of the TTL, I want to make sure that if we have further extensions to the caching model, it will be compatible with those. For example, if we one day define an invalidation protocol, it should be able to slot in with this really nicely. Yeah, um, so and I think that's just wording. The caching model of HTTP. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I've obviously, pull requests, you know, accepted. Um, the notion there, I can try hang around the language of freshness lifetime because that seems to be the most generic way to express yes, that. Yes. Exactly. Um, and because that's the core concept. Uh, regarding 
14, I think you're right. I don't think we need a specific one. We just need to describe the interactions where appropriate and put the appropriate caveats around, you know, here be dragons where necessary. Uh, and issue 15, uh, is the discouragement a RFC 2119 kind of discouragement? It's just text? It's actually a little stronger than that. Okay. But it's, it's not normative, but it's... I, I think, um, you know, generally, uh, maybe we should have a discussion about principles in that, you know, especially when we're talking about how we profile these protocols, uh, uh, illustrating why you might have problems is great. And exploring that space is something we definitely should do. But just preemptively saying don't do that is is perhaps yeah. too much. The current text uses a non-normative should, which you know tickles all kinds of buttons. And so clearly really? we wanna we wanna tweak that a little bit. Okay. I think that's probably too strong. Um and, and we should just explore the space. So Martin Thompson, the reason that I opened issue 14 was because I had some questions about how this worked in practice. Um, if I'm going to try to use some of the HTTP caching semantics, they basically get swallowed if there's a cache on either side of them that's applying the, the strict TTL rules. And so there's not a lot of value that we're getting from using HTTP caching in, in that model. Do you, do you think that's true when the HTTP cache is a shared cache between clients? Well, why would the DNS cache not equally be shared um, is the question. Because they could be in two different clients. OK. Um, you're talking, yeah, you know, I'm not aware of one of those, but maybe, OK. Um, even still, it's you, you would get the sharing at that point, which means that you would get through the first cache because it's not there, and then it would hit the second cache, and that one's shared. Therefore, it's more likely to have a hit. Is that, is that you would your get the sharing in the second layer cache? Yeah, yeah that's mine. Yeah. yeah, even still, I would like to have a little bit of clarity about that because I, I had trouble answering the questions that I had regarding this. And someone suggested to me that maybe finding ways to, to bust that first cache might, might actually be of value. And then again, I've, I'd like the opinion of folks who, who know DNS more um, is cache busting a, a thing that we actually want to have? Because HTTP provides a, numerous ways to deal with that. And if HTTP is going to be involved in this, and we're going to be relying more on the HTTP cache for these things, um, what are the implications of people using those techniques on things like, say, server load? So in the DNS world, we pretty much are in denial about this. Um, that is that the uh, server gives some TTLs, and those are understandable. And what the client does with those is really a local policy. Many of the local policies are to follow it. Some of them are uh, to follow it until it looks like it's going to expire and then preemptively renew. Some of them are to say, I know my number better than theirs. I'm just going to stick my number. And, and those are all very common. So in the DNS world, we actually just assume that it is advisory um, and that you're not, it's not nearly as tight as, as it is um, in the, uh, yes, you do actually. So, okay. Uh, I mean, we've had this discussion in DNS op many times on many drafts. So in fact, we are just living with it. Ben Schwartz as individual contributor. I, I think that the, the logic in the draft works for me, but it took me a long time to understand that logic. Uh, as a simple-minded person uh, and, and implementer, it would be really nice to have a couple of extra sentences explaining things like when you might rewrite the TTL on an HTTP to DNS conversion. Uh, so if you're, it seems like if you're, in, in there are certain models where you, you pull an object out of the HTTP cache and uh, and you actually have to sort of rewrite, shorten its TTL before handing it downstream. Right. So um, the HTTP caching language is um, fairly extensive, shall we say? Um, and it has, you know, as I've been talking more with folks from from the DNS operations community, um, 
I've had to explain some of the finer nuances, like um, like the age header that a cache actually knows the difference between now and when something was generated, how long that's been, and can can make that part of its TTL. And I think perhaps exploring some of that space um, could be a useful contribution here. Yeah. So Ray Bellis, ISC. Uh, yeah, I kind of have to take some issue with what Paul just said. Um, yeah, TTLs are supposed to be. Sorry, yeah, just a, sorry. Um, most clients should be treating the TTL as an absolute maximum, notwithstanding there are some that do. But if, for example, we get a, an HTTP packet, sorry, a DNS packet that comes back from the DNS server that says the TTL is 300 seconds, and that then is, goes through into the HTTP caching headers that says, well, you can remember this for 300 seconds. And then 299 seconds later, somebody else gets the same response back. They've essentially doubled the TTL of that record. And so that's, that's, I'm sorry. So that's actually just what I was referring to. So that's the age concept of the cache. Yeah. So when, when that response is served from the cache on the second iteration, it's served with a, say, an expires time of 300 seconds, but it also has an age of 291, 299. And it's in HTTP rules, it's, in pun, it's required by the client to do that subtraction to know that this, this okay. response only has a one second lifetime left. So you're relying on the HTTP layers to override what's in the... When you're using HTTP caching, you are relying on the HTTP. And the, the whole point of issue 13 is that the HTTP caching semantics are consistent with the DNS yeah. TTLs. Yeah. Right. yeah, I mean, notwithstanding that a lot of t people treat TTLs advisory as a maximum, I think yeah, we should be very clear that so far as possible, we do not extend the TTL records because the TTL, TTL on DNS records are actually for the zone administrator's benefit yep. and not for any downstream user. Downstreams right. are free to use something lower, but they should never go higher. Yep, this this is consistent with that coming through the HTTP. Okay. Ralph, before you go, may I interrupt for one moment? I, <laughs> I beg your uh, forgiveness. The uh, one aspect of this that I want to point out too is that essentially uh, this is blessing unbound. Unbound is a particular DNS implementation of a uh, recursive resolver. And its caching model is one that uses the DNS message as the fundamental unit of cacheable information. And that's kind of contrary to what the DNS people expect as an <coughs> RR set being the fundamental data unit for caching. And so that leads to interesting second order effects where a lot of things get requeried well before they need to be requeried. For example, a CNAME chain that has two hour CNAMES in it and then ends with a 20 second uh, address record will end up being requeried the entire chain every 20 seconds instead of based on the R sets of the C name. So, yeah, and I'll favor nominum. So, I mean, DNS caches on the left side can be sort of uh, magnitude of orders of forwarders, and uh, I'm not sure if that's also true in the HTTP world. But you you have to make sure that uh, you have the shortest time of all this stuff in to make sure that that the stuff is fresh and. Uh, one more question, because I don't know the HTTP stuff too much. What would happen if I give back a TTL of zero? Because that's, I mean, unfortunately getting more and more common in the yes or also. So that, that response would be useful for the request that made it, but would not be used for any future responses. So, so effectively no caching. Correct. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so if if what he said is not true, then that should go to the HTTP working group. Yeah. So wow, many things. Um, so, I would just want to note for people listening online that might not have heard the general groans in the room <laughs> that just followed that assertion. That yeah. There is uh, apparently some disagreement there. <laughs> <laughs> so Warren Kamari, um, a couple of things. Um, when DNS people publish a record with like a 10 minute TTL, they generally sort of double it or so for assuming how long it will actually be used because of things like forwarders. But be careful when you say they. When a server publishes with a 10 minute TTL, yep. please finish the sentence. Yep. The person who operating the server assumes that the record will stay around for sort of 20 minutes or sometimes 30 <clears throat> because there are forwarders. And with forwarders, you just take the TTL and you store it for that and hand it back. Um, so if there is a forwarder and an HTTP cache and then another DNS thing behind it, yes, if it's been cached for two, for sort of supposed to be 300 seconds, been cached for 299, um, you know, maybe that sh TTL should be changed to one if it's handed back to anything that will ever end up in the DS DNS again. But we need to just think about that. Another thing which needs to be kept in mind is there are various records that actually expire at a time. Things like DNS keys, 
um, you know, CSK, KSK have an actual wall time at which they expire. And that needs to be kept in mind as well. And I can't remember what the third thing was, so I will assume it wasn't important, and we'll sit down. Stay there. So you have two things. One is the, the first one you said was maybe the HTTP server should change the TTL in the record. The second one is we have some wall clock mm -hmm. things. Okay. I would like to respond to the first one. Our model so far in the draft has been that the HTTP server is passing along DNS data. If you want something different, please suggest text. Um, uh, I, what, I, yeah, so so that's, you know, you're changing sort of a fundamental thing here, which I'm not saying you mm -hmm. can't do. I'm just saying that that's the first we've heard of that. Second one about the wall clock, again, we are passing things through. There's nothing in here that says if you are passing, say, okay. a DNS key record that has an absurd wall clock time in it, like some in the past or in the future, you should do anything. Again, the idea is we're passing things through. So for the first one, I'm not saying we should necessarily change it. I'm just saying that if it changes operational stuff, whoever's doing this should you know, be aware of that. Maybe changing the record, the TTL on the record is useful. Maybe not. More discussion. Right. Um, on the wall time thing, what I'm concerned about is a record um, arrives. No, it should, it should it should be okay. I was concerned right. a record would end up in the HTTP cache way after it had expired and would continue to it be might, served. Just in the same way yep. that a, a forwarding chain might have done that. We 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 believe that this is like part of the forwarding chain. If not, we need to be specific. Yeah, Jim Reed, RTFM. If we're going to have DNSSEC in this kind of scenario, Paul, um, what would we do about DNSSEC validation type issues? And I'm also thinking in the cache issue about um, aggressive NSEC caching. We are going to do whatever. If if the authoritative server, uh, I'm sorry, if the, the recursive server who you're talking to is doing validation, it's doing validation. If it's not, it's not. I mean, it's no different than the current state. Okay. Uh, we're trying to be not special. Okay. You leave yourself wide open there. Mark Nottingham. Um, Mark, you can be special. <laughs> oh, Paul. Um, listening to the comments, um, I think it's safe to say that we're kind of witnessing a little bit of a collision of cultures in that there are some people in the room who are very fluent in HTTP caching and don't know a darn thing about DNS. And I feel like that. Um, I think Patrick probably knows more about DNS than I do. Um, he's squinting. Um, and, and other people know a lot about DNS and have a lot of contacts there and don't really understand HTTP. Um, and so I think maybe we can look at a couple of different ways of improving that. Um, if, if the spec were to con contain a number of worked examples of the messages on the wire in complete in toto yeah. as well as the deployment scenario that would probably help um if if yes if the draft uh were to be extra careful about its terminology because you know I, i've already heard a bit of confusion about caching and, and different things and and finally if if we can do a little bit of education i mean i'm more than happy to arrange to give people an http caching tutorial um I, I can do that, maybe in London or, or whatever. And if somebody could do it on the DNS side, I sure would appreciate that personally. Um, I would love to have those happen before London, since we are sort of on a short leash. Um, if we have a virtual interim before then, I think that those two tutorials would be really good. I would not give the TTL one. In fact, I might make Ray do it. Um, but yeah, I think that that would actually help these issues. And as for the examples, I just did a quick check. I think worked out examples with times in them would actually be really good because if nothing else, that would shock some of the DNS people into understanding what we do ourselves anyways. We don't have worked out examples like that in any of the DNS RFCs. Okay. And as for being careful about terminology, I'm going to switch hats quickly. Um, RFC 7719, 7719 is DNS terminology. Um, and uh, that is being revised in the DNS Op Working Group, and I'm the author. So if any HTTP people are reading either 7719 or Terminology BIS, and you say, oh, I was expecting this to explain this about DNS to me, and they don't, please speak up now. We're going to be in Working Group last call on the BIS soon, and this is exactly what this document 
is meant to, to help. Okay. Can, can I make one more request then? Um, in the HTTP world, we have a, a homepage, httpwg.org, that has a listing of all the relevant specifications and current specifications for HTTP. And so if you want to understand part of HTTP, you can get the correct reference at least. I can't claim that it will make you understand HTTP, but at least you can get the correct reference. DNS, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, is very confusing from the outside. So you haven't read 7719 yet. Obviously. Because one of the things when I started it eons ago was let's just define things. And everyone was like, which RFC is that coming from? It is full of this thing is defined in these two sentences. But if okay. you want more, here's where they're quoted from. Okay. So it, can we use that as a roadmap to understand modern DNS? Is that the right yes, place to start? That, that's one of the intentions. Okay. And it's 7719. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll send that, I'll send that to the mailing list. And Please I'll do. Send the pointer, okay, Thank and you. I'll send a pointer to the, oh, did you already send a pointer to the BIS? Great. Already done. And if, well, I'll send a, Pointer for the HTTP stuff. Thanks. Okay, and now Mark Andrews is joining us from the Meet Echo queue. Um, Warren was talking about forwarders. They all count down, or otherwise they're broken, which means the entire forwarder queue will expire the uh, record or the RS at, at the same time. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, John Levine. Uh, I would like to strongly endorse the suggestion that we work out some some examples of how the caching interacts. I mean, because I can imagine a way to use the HTTP date header to adjust down the TTLs in the in the received data in an, in a received library, which seems too ugly to live. But I, you know, I I'd, I'd like to make sure we all agree that we either do or don't want to do something like that. Yeah, I think we're pro examples, but actually, the example you cited, HTTP prohibits, but. <laughs> So, Martin Thompson, I wanted to um, sort of applaud that. Um, please send the 7719 biz link to the list so that uh, everyone can find it. Tim, Thank Tim you. has already done Thanks, that. Tim. Oh, even better. I can send PRs. Um, the... <laughs> no, I won't. I promise I won't. Um, no, no, I promise that you will. I, I, yeah. Um, this really is one of the reasons we have done that. And, it, I, you know, no... no negative on Mark about the homepage for HTTP. This is, you know, DNS is hard for outsiders to understand, and this was one of the reasons we did this. And if it's not fulfilling that, you all here, you know, are on the bleeding edge. So um, we talked about revalidation briefly. Was the conclusion there that we would say virtually nothing about revalidation? Because I, I, I think there's some interesting things we could do with things like stale while, while re revalidate and those sorts of things in this in this space that would be really interesting. Yeah, I think we can, as Mark said, sort of explore the space. I don't know if there's anything normative we want to say, you know, in terms of how you use this. I think this is going to be one of those BCP things where um, the draft as it is discourages revalidation. It probably shouldn't do that. HTTP is what it is, and 304 is what it is, and, you know, if modified is what it is, and, you know, so we really shouldn't say anything strong about that, but, you know, exploring the interactions between stale while revalidate and exploring the interactions around, you know, what does a 304 really buy you in terms of like byte guys size versus the actual DNS thing and all that. I think that's worth spending some text on. Yeah. So the, um, the point was made about our asset caching as opposed to message caching. And have either of you put any thought into the splitting of our assets out um, so and using something like, say, push, which then you could... Wait, splitting them out where? What do you mean by splitting them out? Splitting them out into separate responses. So, Martin, mm. I, yeah, so, so Martin is suggesting that the DNS API server would extract the minimal RRs from that RR set. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on the specifics, but there's always the related... Um, things in so since that hasn't really been discussed in the DNS world, I don't think it would be good to start it here. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and that, now that you fine response, it, you you have infected like the DNS people in here, and I'm sure we're going to get start getting drafts in DNS op next week about this. But for now, no, we haven't discussed that, and boy, do I would like to I, continue not to. I, no, I like this. <laughs> So I mean, so Patrick I mean, likes it. Yeah. Well, anytime you, anytime you use push in a clever way, I, I like it. Um, 
for, for some no, very I, large I, clever. I, I, don't, I don't like traditional uh, implications of, of push, but I think this one's really interesting because it allows you to split N records into the one you want, which is your primary response, and then N minus one pushes as your additional records. And you can give yeah, that, that and you can give them individual individual freshness, freshness times. times. That's, oh, that's that's what really, I was getting that's at. That's really sexy, Mark. Right, yeah. right. So I, I just want to point out visually, uh, one of the two co-chairs of DNS Op is sitting here wincing and possibly crying almost. Um, I <laughs> Uh, just a little bit dust in her eye, right, uh, from the future of this sandstorm that's coming towards us. So, no, we haven't done it. If the DNS off working group gets ahead of us on this, it would be part of this. And But no, again, let's not, let's not try to change the, the way DNS is working just for this. this. This is a fine response. I just felt beholden to inflict this upon the, the working group as part of Mark's culture clash um, yeah. theme. Yeah, I, I mean... It, I do find the culture clash thing interesting. I would have never thought of that here. I would have thought you would have thought it was a bad idea. And the fact that my co-author got excited about that, yeah. <laughs> right. ben, yep. ben Schwartz, I just want to point out that that probably is not application DNS UDP wire format. Right, it would, it would be wire, wires format, <laughs> you know, right? Well, and... Uh, now, uh, I also want to observe that we're actually have been well into the time that we just left for general discussion on the draft. The mic line is empty at the moment. Did you have more you wanted to say before we went into just general draft discussion? I think that was discussion? our last slide. That's right, okay. I thought so too. Yeah. So yeah, let's. Are which we is have, why I didn't stop right. the discussion. Are we excused? Yeah. No, no, no. He's no, you have to stay here to get whatever else now people want to bring up about the draft. So, are there other issues about? What we've done, you know, the protocol draft at this point, since there is the other ones, are there, I mean, we just opened up cans of worms, um, but are there other things that people who have been reading the draft are current, you know, like want to bring up right now? Because I think there's plenty more to be discussed in the second half. So I think you're free and I'll follow you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much to the authors. Uh, we don't. We don't exactly have slides. This is now. This is now uh, an open discussion, and uh, the the question here is: What other technical issues should we be addressing beyond the the contents of this protocol? So. Ray Bellis, ISC. Um, if this is to be implemented using, for example, a front-end HTTP proxy, which is then talking wire format to a downstream server, uh, I have a draft in DNSOP called Draft Bellis DNSOP XPF, which is for carrying um, the original client's transport information, for example, their IP address ports and so forth, to the back-end server. Uh, so just an appeal to get more review of that draft, please, because we're hoping it's going to have a call for adoption around this. I do want to get that adopted, and the HTTP proxy is a perfect use case for this. It's intended only for server-side proxies or protocol converters, and uh, it just needs more review. So, thank you. Hi, this is Elliot. So this is a follow-up to the email discussion we've had on list. Um, there were basically three issues that I raised um, uh, on the list. Uh, the first was uh, that had to do with um, uh, split DNS and how this worked with split DNS uh, as an operational issue. The second had to do with uh, global server load balancing. The third had to do with uh, uh, security appliances and tools that actually use DNS in enterprises uh, relating to uh, uh, trying to pre prevent malware or detect malware. Um, in discussions on the list, what I think we, we, we found at least some common ground on one of those issues I think Mark had uh, a suggestion at least to point out in terms of how we deal with global server load balances, uh, lo uh, global server load balancers, um, and just private conversations with some of the people around. It seems like there's uh, an easy way around addressing um, uh, split DNS in terms of, at, at, the, at the bare minimum, a, a configuration point. Uh, in terms of understanding what's local versus what's not, so you know when you don't need when when you can't really use like a DOS server that is outside some 
proxy boundary, for instance. Um, and the third issue around cybersecurity and, and uh, doing uh, scans of, DN of uh, the, the DNS packets, looking for packets, I think, uh, looking for malware, I think that one sort of remains open, but the one suggestion I think I saw on the list was, well, we just don't use it if, if this is the thing that you, you are worried about. Um, my point in all of this is, I think probably there's, you know, if those are the three issues that anybody could think of around this, I think there's probably just, you know, a paragraph or two at most that we could probably add into the draft. And I just suggest a, a, that I create a pull request and people can review it and then decide whether they really feel the need for a, you know, for somebody to publish a large internet draft for a one paragraph issue. So that's, uh, that's what I want to mention. If there are, you know, I, I meant to mention them, these things as issues, they can be resolved in various different ways. You know, some of them are, you know, as simple as you know what was suggested, which is you know have a manual configuration. People can explore things like proxy packs or not. That was not meant. To, uh, I don't. I don't feel the need like we have to solution engineer absolutely everything here for this. But just to you know mention the issue, and even if we if we have one simple approach to get around something, then then that should be enough from an operational consideration standpoint. And if people want to get further, you know, more elaborate about it, that's fine too. But we don't have to. Not all that has to go into a draft. Uh, I, I, the draft is relatively compact. It's relatively well written, and rather not, you know, uh, you know, disturb that with lots of operational stuff. But if we can keep it, if we can keep a paragraph or two small, you know, to address these things, it's not uncommon to have uh, in our RFCs, you know, some operational consideration discussion. Uh, if it if it's compact, if it's a a whole model or a whole new deployment approach, then then yeah, you fork that off into an internet draft. So I'll stop there. Patrick, are you? going to, to speak to editorial concerns about the, the structure of the draft in, uh, in relation to this? I think it's a working group. Uh, I don't have to be asked twice to hug the microphone. Um, sure. I mean, I think most of the considerations brought up are probably similar things to what, you know, deprive how to consider. I mean, most of these things are a matter of if your recursive resolver is different than your default recursive resolver, what happens, right? Um, and I was just actually trying to call up the deprive draft and say, what did they do? Um, and I'm sure I would say my interpretation of my 10 second read of that at the mic, but I'm sure other people here have actually probably lived through that discussion and know better, but it didn't look like they did very much um, on that topic. Um, and so to the extent that this is just a, really a question about you know, who your recursive resolver is or, who, or whether or not you're encrypted, um, I'm happy to give a sentence or two. Like literally, I mean, if there is a paragraph we can write, but you know, given how much time is spent at the mic on the topic, I'm a little concerned that we'll be able to get it into two or three sentences, right? If it goes more than two or three sentences, I really do believe um, that's a distraction in a protocol document if it doesn't have a lot of implications for how you implement the protocol. And we should consider you know, doing that doing that separately. So if I may just respond. I, I was just going to say, you know, on, just on that point, I'm perfectly happy to negotiate with you between two or three sentences and a paragraph. And uh, so uh, as uh, kind of half a hat as co-chair, I know that one of my own personal concerns uh, from the DNS world perspective has been uh, the greater ecosystem in which this gets used. Uh, but I see that as a separate document from just how can we describe the protocol and what the protocol should be doing. And, you know, it, it, and to the extent that my concerns about the greater ecosystem and its applicability um, are something that needs to be documented, I think it's going to be quite a bit more than just a couple of paragraphs. Hello. 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 Sorry, this is uh, Stephen from Rack10. Um, I'm totally new here, so please correct me if I'm wrong anywhere. Um, so I was trying to 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 think that based based on the security implementation of of DNS over HTTPS, the underlying protocol HTTPS, I mean, relies on PKI basically in that sense. When we want to validate whether a certificate is valid, so we basically have to put the trust on the certificate that the HTTPS server presented in this situation. Now, most of the CAs, most of the commercial CAs basically rely on HTTP or something similar to basically publish the CRL or using, using OCSP in that situation. So basically, 
we now have a circle of dependency here because unless we're saying, okay, we're not totally replacing um, uh, DNS, we're just basically using it as an, as an addition. Otherwise, we have a circular dependency here that says you need DNS to resolve those names in order to, to, be, to pin on that trust. But now there's no mechanism for you to validate whether that underlying DNS is, well, of course, you could use DNSSEC or you could potentially define a, spe a special CA that uses IP address. Yeah, or, or you staple it in some way. Um, but but then how how exactly, I mean, do we actually looking at solving this issue or is there any other ways? Because if we staple it, I mean, and, and then we, we go back to whether there's a new certificate issued for the same thing and the clients would have to be updated in some sense. So, yeah. So Martin Thompson, I think there's a there's a really easy answer to this, and the one that Patrick just said, um, OCSP stapling means that you don't have to go to another server to get the answer that you need. And so, if we, I, it might actually make sense for us in this group to even mandate the use of OCSP stamp stapling in this particular context, simply to avoid that that circular dependency. Um, otherwise, we en end up in a situation where you have to use some other form of DNS, or you have to not worry about revocation for the period that you're going off and searching for the CRLs and or OCSP responses. Uh, OCSP stapling is good practice, and so I don't feel particularly uncomfortable about recommending good practice. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to HTTP2, yeah. Um, and now I've forgotten what I was up here to say. Adam Roach, hat off. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out about the operational considerations that uh, have been brought up is that some of these are likely to have um, proposed mitigations that actually bear on the implementations. So for example, if you were to have uh, a recommendation that implementations have exceptions for local domains in some way, putting that off into a separate document, I suspect would probably not get it read by most implementations. So I, I have some sympathy for the prospect that at least some aspect of this is likely to be useful in the protocol document itself. Um, so what I what I think I'd like to see is uh, like putting together some text about what this is, you know, what these considerations will look like, and determining whether we need them or some of them in the protocol document before we sort of you know rule them in or out of scope sight unseen. Mark Nottingham. Um, Taylor, you mentioned an ecosystem document. Could you sure. expand upon that? You, you mentioned having an ecosystem document. Well, not that one exists. No, but but you have something in mind, or? Well, so. Mike. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Mike, like, so there are a number of questions about, uh, you know, uh, the, the data authorization model, right? The, the in, integrity of the DNS and, and different aspects of, are we, like right now, we're essentially defining a protocol that could be the norm for now HTTP servers to push down all kinds of DNS data into a client and say, oh, hi, even though I'm example.com server, I'm going to tell you about adserver.com. And we're not defining anything right now about, you know, it pulling in same origin model or whatever else um, that's in this current document to talk about how do we know whether the data we're getting is trustworthy. Now, there is the one aspect certainly that if you're configuring a DNS over HTTP server to just be like a resolver that you're already trusting blindly in the current system, that's one thing. But if there's the possibility that this is a mechanism that is going to be used to introduce DNS data to a client, I want to see that area fully explored about what all those implications are, especially with regard to the way that current DNS operators work and the expectations they have about <coughs> how their data is getting used. Sure. Um, so. I have o I am only aware of one use case primarily for this to start with, which is user configures manually somehow, just like they can configure an alternative resolver, they configure a DOS server in their software or their OS, probably in their software to start. Um, if, if, if it's going to be something that's, you know, I, I know there was a big discussion in chartering about JavaScript something, somehow having some secret mechanism to do this. Um, I, I think that's a red herring because that would have to go through the W3C and be specified as an API or, you know, one of the browser vendors would have to 
actually think it was a good idea to do that. And I don't think there's any evidence at all of that. Um, I, I'd love to be proven well, wrong. So I'll interrupt and say that the conversation that you and I had in Toronto was that there was evidence that browser vendors were interested in bypassing DNS latency times by being able to serve DNS. Wow, your memory is so much better than mine. <laughs> <sighs> it's all that drinking. JavaScript was not part of that conversation. No, JavaScript. Oh, good, good. Yeah, uh, well, sure. I mean, performance is of always of interest to people running websites for, for well-understood reasons. Um, I, I just wanted to, to remind us that our charter says we will coordinate with DNS op in Interia. So I'm wondering if there is a joint document or some separate document that might evolve out of that. And also part of the part of the charting discussion was a, a huge sidetrack about discovery mechanisms. And I'm wondering if anybody is proposing a discovery mechanism document um, or whether it makes just sense to write down that initial use case and say, that's how we're starting. So uh, on the charter, uh, I will note that the, we don't have the text here, but I will note that the, the text of the charter says uh, that we are chartered to define mechanisms for discovery of DOE servers similar to existing mechanisms for discovering other DNS servers. Can you scroll down a bit more? Uh, May define mechanisms. Uh, I, 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 I hope that's not being interpreted as a requirement to do so. Uh, I, so I don't think there's, a, there's certainly not a requirement to do so here. Uh. And I think there's also some question about uh, whether some of the, some of the more uh, far out mechanisms that we're talking about are essentially dissimilar to existing mechanisms for discovery. Right. I, th I think my understanding of that discussion was maybe somebody w might want a DHCP option to discover your local DOE server, um, which seems really weird to me. But somebody wanted to talk about it. Adam, do you have a relevant hat comment here? If we're looking at relevance of this on the charter, I would encourage everyone to read all the way down to the if and what comes after that. Right. This is this is definitely an optional part of what the working group might do. So, Martin Thompson, uh, two things. Um, so, to Elliot's three points, uh, I think we're blowing that up way out of proportion. I think if we see Elliot's proposed text, it will make it very very clear. Um, however, I would caution that taking on the people who want to look at what's in the packets question is going to blow it up more than we we already have. And so we should probably avoid that one. Uh, the second one was the, the concerns about uh, configuration or um, random servers on the internet sending me DNS responses, which um, sounds kind of scary. Um, this is a fear that is grounded in some reality, at least, in that I now have a client that is going off and talking to servers using the protocol that they can use to make those things appear, right? So we need to be a little bit careful on this front. So I'm, I've got a web browser, I go to a site, and it sends me, it pushes me uh, the, the dot well known with a request for some, some DNS request in it, and it provides a what appears to be a legitimate response. What am I to do with that? Well, obviously, you just don't do anything with it, but there's questions here about how that how people are uh, expect uh, uh, how people are approaching this particular situation now obviously if you've configured a particular uh, server as your dns api server you're not going to have that response that's come from some random server somehow appear in the cache that's just not going to happen so um i think we're safe there's no problem but um we we need to uh, may we might maybe sort of make a nod and a wink in the direction of that sort of thing. Because I do know that there are people who really do want to do things like push those things for their own servers. So I'm, I'm talking to a particular server and it says, oh, oh by the way, um, here's a, an alternative service you can connect to. And by the way, also, um, here's the IP address of that thing. Save you the time. And that's the sort of thing that I want to make sure we're really crisp about because if we're not crisp about it, people will do those sorts of things and 
I'm sure many minds were blown in the process of thinking about that and trying to work out the ramifications. And I'd rather not go, go there just, just yet. Maybe eventually, not right now. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Sullivan. I, I'm a little um, concerned sitting here that uh, we're putting the cart and the horse in the wrong order, uh, particularly worrying about like, is it one document or 18 documents or something in between? Uh, it, it became very clear to me in the earlier discussion around, for instance, how caches are going to interoperate, that we have two sets of people in the room, neither of whom speak the same language. Uh, and, and I think the best way to work that out probably is to work through a bunch of worked examples. Whether they go into the document, whether they go into another document, whether we do them all on the mailing list and then decide this should be on a web page somewhere, I don't really care. But I do think that we'd better work some of those things out in, in detail pretty promptly. Um, or we're going to continue to to founder on this. Uh, this example, for instance, of um, of data showing up kind of randomly at a client uh, from some DNS thing somewhere and it being accepted um, maybe sounds really weird if you're uh, familiar with um, HTTP, but if you're familiar with the history of the DNS, that's not weird at all. It happens all the time. And we call it poison. Um, so so I, I think that that's something that we, we want to work out in, in a certain amount of detail. And, and again, I, I think the mechanics of what document this goes into and so on, we should put that off until we sort of work out some some concrete things. Thanks. Couple things. One, uh, uh, Pat McManus, um, pop the stack back to uh, um, certificate revocation. Um, we talked about maybe recommending OCSP stapling. I think uh, we've seen that different clients do revocation checking differently. Um, that's one of the different ways, Paul's not at all, but that's not, that's not my browser. Um, in any event, um, and much like other things about HTTPS, we would not specify, you know, like what routes you would use or any of those good kinds of things. Perhaps not go into the details, but we could explore the fact that if you do this wrong, there um, there is a loop. And hey, with not at all, you got to admit there's no loop. Um, okay, and then um, to uh, to pop the stack back to what Taylor was talking about um, with other operational considerations. Uh, I had thought during chartering we were pretty close pretty clear on the resolution of like what this would cover and what wouldn't cover. Um, clearly the case for regressive resolver is the primary use case. We're all on board with that. Um, this question of, you know, JavaScript and the thing about the W3C, well, you don't really need the W3C if you're just going to directly, you know, use the HTTP methods specified in here. You can just do it out of fetch or XHR. But as Martin said, you don't have to worry about those answers ending up anywhere where they'd be mistaken as IP addresses by other parts of the system. JavaScript just does not have those kinds of privileges. Um, I would not worry about it. We can write a sentence that says that, but I would not worry about it. And then the third and interesting case that's always lurking over everyone is what happens if this website pushes me these uh, unrelated addresses, right? Um, in my view, that is clearly not something that Doe directly enables. It would be, you know, a spec it would be an HTTP spec violation because HTTP defines how you decide where you get your information from an origin on. And that is generally through DNS. We've recently added an extension proving that we really do define this um, called origin frame, um, which is a slight twist on that matter. And you could conceive of the group, Mark's looking at me like he doesn't think origin frame is a twist on the DNS, which is interesting. Um, Okay, and you could conceive of you know Doe given information becoming something else that the HTTP group would want to consider for routing information, but Doe does not enable that by itself. That would be an HTTP decision. It's not been made. You know, there's obviously a ton of stuff to consider in making it. So I would want to make sure we didn't write logic that said, you know, this could never be done. But we can certainly say this does not enable it. I hope that's clear. Yeah, I hear a lot of people scared that other people are going to be confused. So. Uh, I, I think a little bit of clarity, um, and, and maybe using the word words words to the effect of "don't poison yourself" might help a lot. I, I would also Please. I would like to point out that when we had the boff in Seoul, and the 85 people showed up for the room for 24, and as you observed, there was a lot of different impressions about what DNS over HTTPS would mean and what that implied, and so I do think that clarity around that saying, no, this is not supposed to be a mechanism to 
poison your cash is, right. <laughs> is useful to pursue. Uh, what do you think what I'm saying is that appropriate level of clarity or not? No, I was uh, agreeing. I, I, I heard you saying that we should probably just have clarity here. Yeah, and it is what I described, I and mean, this is really an editorial question at this point, is what I described the kind of text you're looking for? Yeah, I think it's a good direction. Okay. Mike Bishop, Akamai. So a lot of what I got to say echoes the previous comments that when we're dealing in HTTP with the, uh, the idea that's been floated around of pushing DNS resources, well, probably if you're going to do that, it would have to be DNSSEC because otherwise it is poisoning your DNS cache. But the, uh, the origin extension to HTTP2 also means that we rely less on DNS for that. And so the use case where we wanted to push DNS records has largely gone away if you implement origin. So, well, you have solved one of the major use cases to some degree, fine. So I, uh, I think the charter fairly clearly rules that out. I think we're, we're mostly done unless we just wanna say in the spec that it's not intended for the following use cases. Eric Klein, I wanted to ask an implementation question sort of that may be too early uh, and also will, of course, betray my deep and abiding ignorance. Uh, well, late last night in some conversations about DNS over TLS uh, and DNS over TCP sort of things, the question of uh, pipelining many queries to a server uh, yielded uh, a result where, like, what happens when the server sort of has too many of your queries, right? And in, in HTTP, we have 429, too many queries, but I don't know what we really do in, in, in DNS. Uh, they just get dropped. <laughs> yeah. But, but in, the, in, in, a persistent, in a persistent connection, do you wait for the connection to be dropped then and closed? Do we? Very implementation dependent. There's definitely nothing defined in the protocol to say what should happen there. And there's nothing, there's nothing that would help here, uh, semantic wise, on the HTTP side that would make things clearer? Yeah, so Martin Thompson, um, HTTP2 actually has a bunch of mechanisms in it to sort of pr protect against these this class of attack. Uh, it limits the number of concurrent requests that you can make. Uh, it provides very specific control over um, things like buffers and all um, compression state and all of the things that a, that a server might have to um, exhaust in the in the process of actually dealing with all of those requests. So um, I think that here we have a reasonably good story if we go with the, the endorsed version of the protocol. Um, and I think uh, other than that, we're the still in the wild, wild west. The other one is just one at a time anyway. Right? Not yeah, the, the, yeah, HTTP 1.1, uh, we probably want to go back to the rules in HTTP 1.1 about the number of connections because that's really going to limit the number of requests you can have concurrently. And I mean, the actual number varies, but it's six, sixteen, two. Um, pick pick a number. It's not really specified, but it, there's there's text about it, and and anyone who creates a thousand connections to a server gets what they deserve. Thank you. Uh, now, Lorenzo Clarity, I, I I have to say I, I don't think other people will be confused. I don't I don't know enough to say that, but I do know that I'm confused um, because this text is. What like I don't understand, for example, you know, if I'm the web server, for example, dot com, and I've certified myself as such, you know, can I update the quad A record, for example, dot com? Yes. No. No. Okay. Um, so where does it say that? Uh, I see. It, it, where does it say here that that work is out of scope? Is it out of scope, or is it not out of scope? It is not out of scope. Well, Hoffman, it's not that it's out of scope. It doesn't work in HTTP. You, you're, you're going cross-origin and such. If you haven't asked for it, you just don't get it. Then that's what we're talking about. We might need to clarify that a bit more. It's not that it's out of scope that we don't want you to do it. You, that's just not what we're doing. Uh, OK, so then what does it mean down there that it says we can define mechanisms for, may define mechanisms to, uh, where is it? Um, 
for discover to discover recursive resolvers are those mechanisms going to be because like today that to discover recursive resolvers that you want to use it's not just that oh look here's a recursive resolver in the same way in the dns right now there's lots of open recursive resolvers but if somebody was if a dns uh, stub resolver said oh look here's an, oh, an open recursor i'm going to start using it now which is you know a completely insane thing to do they could probably do that here and we're not endorsing it but we can't prevent somebody from doing insane things saying look i you know i i found a glass of water on the ground i'm just going to drink it because i'm thirsty uh and so and so but perhaps perhaps implicit in the words recursive resolver or a recursive revolver that you want to use for all domains then because yes. yes. ah. that, that is complete yes okay so maybe i just don't know what that means then so a recursive resolver is something that you're going to use for everything uh, generally in the DNS world, that's absolutely right. Your DHCP server gives you an address. No, no, no. I, I, I think okay. I know how it works in DNS. Okay. It, it's just like it says similar. So it's like, I don't know what it, what is in what is or is in, not in scope. That, that's okay. Okay. Before Elliot explodes, I think he should jump. Yeah. Can I make a suggestion that let's have this discussion when there's actually a proposal of some text in front of us? Because right now we're having the charter discussion. And we're already charted. And we actually have some issues to close that on the existing text. Is yeah. that okay? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So if it's not, if you aren't seeing the existing text, let us know. Yeah. Um, so I just had a logistical question um, regarding the, the the three ones that I mentioned, and 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 I think uh, Andrew had a had a point which uh, about you know maybe developing out the the, the use cases for sorry the Andrew had a, a a suggestion about developing out use cases and having and having text around you know the, these use cases i just want to know how you how the chairs want to proceed in terms of doing that because i i'd offer to generate a pull request for you know a paragraph and um and if if, if you want to follow through in a different approach i'm okay just tell me what you guys want to do yeah i think that's a that's a good approach um by all means propose text on the mailing list and in uh and, and in pull requests and uh and if that turns out not to work, then we can uh, we can find another way. Thank you. So, seeing no more comments, uh, I will ask the the last question from our agenda: uh, Is uh, is there anybody who wants to volunteer to do something like write another draft? Uh, beyond what we've already discussed here in terms of amendments to our current one draft. Okay. Seeing no volunteers. <laughs> Alex Mayover. Um, I'm actually not volunteering to, to write yet another draft, but what I can see, we are currently facing quite a few different, I would say, extensions. Uh, to the DNS way that we operate the DNS actually in DNS op. And I suppose that people would probably start to reflect those additions, let me put it that way, to the DNS protocol back into DNS away GDP as soon as this protocol gets traction. Yeah. So things like um, extended response codes yeah, that we are discussing in DNS op right now. Um, I mean, it it is essentially an EDNS zero option, but it has a couple of implications that go actually beyond uh, beyond poor uh, proxying of the DNS contents. So I suppose from that direction, we're gonna see like a couple of um, copies of things that go on in DNS op. So Paul Hoffman responding to that, um, it is our belief currently that it is wire format. So anything that comes and goes, the, and the receiver of the wire format should be acting like a stub resolver, possibly a newish stub resolver with things like that. If you see things that um, tickle that, uh, please send them to the list. I think that there might be a short list. I hope the list is zero length, but if we're wrong, it, it would be good to see those. But our, our current intention and what it says specifically in the current draft is, its wire format, including EDNS, whatever. So, so, but that means just like you're saying that stale response, we have a bunch of things sort of in flight in DNS op, but those all expect 
um, the receiver to do something different, and the receiver of this data would do something different. We're not expecting the server, you know, the, the one who's, who's encapsulating the wire format and pushing it down to do anything different, including on the TTL stuff. That, and that comes up in the same way. Hi, I'm Andrew Sullivan. Coming back to the question from the chairs about drafts, I, I'm not here to volunteer to write a draft because I, I feel like it may be premature. Um, I, I think what I was trying to suggest earlier was that maybe what we need are a, a bunch of threads on the on the mailing list first to sort of figure out, look, are there things here that 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 could coalesce into something that could be a draft? At the moment, I think you know if we try to write this down, it's just going to be incoherent, um, and and we got too many things to work out. It, it, it was very obvious from this discussion today that there's a whole bunch of things that are big gaps, and if we could if we could narrow this down a little bit in discussion on the list or an in interim or anything like that, I think that would be more useful than than trying to write a draft that is just full of holes. So I just want to agree that I don't think it should be inferred that if at the end of the session we have nobody saying, oh, let's do another draft, that doesn't mean that the working group is concluded just when the one draft is concluded. It, it, we're still exploring the area and we're not likely to come to conclusions about it in this session. Hmm. Mark Nottingham, could you scroll all the way to the bottom? Well, one of the real charms of this charter when it went around was the very short timeline. And I think that sold this working group to a lot of people. I would suggest that that maybe we keep the document list very short, um, as as short and close to one as possible. Um, having said that, from what I'm hearing here, uh, I'm not certainly not volunteering, although I can put some effort in. It might be helpful if there were a throwaway ID or a wiki page or something describing what people think the use case for this protocol is. I know we've kind of avoided that till now because we have a lot of different. Is it in the document? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. I would have never agreed to do this with Patrick without a use case. Yeah, it's right up in front. And so if that's wrong, we should fix it. But it's right there up in front. OK, I'll take another look at it then. OK, thanks. Never mind. Sorry. Keep it short. My impression is that we are done. Is that right? Uh, we we still have we still have time. Uh, the SAG meeting over in the other room is about to get to an agenda in their security dispatch section on OCSP over DNS. So people who are interested in this multi-layer thing <laughs> might want to go there. Uh, yeah, we'll call it. I think we are done with discussion for now. So if you want to pop over to SAG, feel free. If I synthesize everything I've learned at this IETF, we could do OCSP over DNS over HTTP over TLS over HTTP over TLS over you forgot UDP? Quick. Quick over UDP. Yeah. Over quick, yes. Please remember to sign the blue sheets. If you haven't signed them, we have them waiting for you here up front. Yes. Okay. Do you want to go through this? No, I don't. Uh, I don't necessarily want to go there. I don't